Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to July. We are recording this on July 1st. You won't see this until the 4th or 5th. But July, most of you know, was named after Julius Caesar. And the month was previously known as Quintilis. And if it sounds like the number 5 from Quint, you're right. Uh, the Roman calendar July was the fifth month of the year because they started in March. But a lot of other interesting things have happened in July, some more than others. In 1963, zip codes were introduced and began being used. And it also is Cell Phone Courtesy Month, National Bison Month, Lasagna Awareness Month, which I think we should all take part of. And it's also National Baked Bean Month. But probably most important, it is National Doghouse Repair Month. So welcome to July. Uh, we have passed the summer solstice and the days are beginning to shorten up once again. Hi, I'm Pastor Gretchen Hope Wilson. It's my privilege to welcome you to this service of worship on Sunday, July 5th, on this Independence Weekend. On this weekend, when we celebrate the independence of the United States of America, we are mindful that there is still much healing that needs to happen in our land. I think of the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and the words of that first stanza. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the rolling sea. I especially find my heart dwelling on the words till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. And we know that in our nation at this time, we have much work to do for the ringing of the harmonies of liberty to be true and for all of God's children in our country to feel the truth of liberty and to have that sense of freedom and ease of being. And so it is our prayer as you join us in worship on this, the 5th of July, that we would continue to pray together and work together for the justice and the change that we need in our nation at this time. So thank you for joining us in worship today, and I pray that it will be an enriching experience for you. Please know that a little bit later in this service, Pastor Rich will be leading us in a communion service. So I invite you if you would like to hit the pause button and get some elements for communion so that you can participate in that a little bit later in the service. What does the Lord require of you? 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 Please join in our call to worship. The words will be coming up alongside me here someplace, and I will read the one part, and I will also read the all part, and you can read with me. God is in this house today, for God longs to be in relationship with us. God is in this house today. For God loves the sinners and the saints. 
God is in this house today. For God sees all, claims all, and loves all. God is in this house today. So let us worship Holy God. Our opening hymn is This Is My Song. Uh, please join along. Please join for our prayer of confession and reconnection. Gracious God, Zacchaeus valued money over people and power over equality. He was a sinner, but so are we. And like Zacchaeus, we are quick to prioritize the wrong things, valuing our to-do lists over family time our own success over a relationship with you, and wealth over generosity. We lose sight of what really matters. We lose sight of love. Forgive us for our ignorance and impatience. Call us back to the life you long for us to lead. With humility and gratitude, we pray. Amen. Let's take a few moments in silence for our own personal concerns and needs. Amen. We come before God to hopefully Slow down, take the time to smell the roses, to enjoy the fresh air, to enjoy each other even though we can't be near each other. God has been with us through all these changes through all the years. 
and he will be continuing to do so for all the years to come. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please take some time, enjoy our uh, bell choir singing, playing an American medley. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 32, 1 through 7. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And while I kept silence, my body wasted away 
through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of the mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Selah. The word of the Lord. Born, a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be to work to speak out to witness and worship for everyone born the right to be free and God will delight when we are created of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. Our second scripture reading for today comes from Luke's Gospel, the 19th chapter. It's a story about a character within scripture that is familiar to many from even early Sunday school days. If you were a child who grew up going to Sunday school, you probably learned about the character named Zacchaeus. It's interesting, though, in Luke's Gospel that this story of Jesus going through the town of Jericho, which is just north out of Jerusalem, comes while he is en route to Jerusalem and comes in that time period right before he is arrested. And so it is significant, I think, to ponder that Jesus stopped in Jericho when he was en route with his mind, his heart set toward Jerusalem. He stopped and took time to be with this man named Zacchaeus. So let us listen then to God's word as it comes before us this day as we have it in the 19th chapter of Luke's gospel. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up at him and said, Zacchaeus? Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded any one of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we give you thanks for this story about one named Zacchaeus from a town called Jericho, a place where Jesus stopped in his journey to Jerusalem to be with this one, 
that his life might be changed. May you be with us as we look at this story today. May you help us to apply its truths to our own lives. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Those of you who grew up going to Sunday school probably remember this story in large part because of a song that many of us sang when we went to Sunday school as children. Those of you who know it know it goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And then it goes on, and a little bit later in the song, Jesus is saying to him, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. I can remember being in the Holy Land in 2014 with a group from our church, and we stopped in that town of Jericho, just north of Jerusalem. And I remember our guide pulling the bus over and stopping in the middle of Jericho so that we could all get out and take in the magnitude of a sycamore tree. And of course, we all began to think about this story about Zacchaeus. And it was so fun when some of the women who were on that trip gathered in a little song circle and began to sing that song about Zacchaeus. It was one of those fun moments for me on that trek in the Holy Land that time. Amen. I liked that song in Sunday school, I think in part because I was a small child and I loved to climb trees. And that was the main thing that I remembered about Zacchaeus, that he was short in stature and that he could climb a tree. And I can remember as a child thinking, that's pretty cool that he climbed up in a tree to see Jesus. But years later, as I studied more deeply in God's word, I began to see that this story about Zacchaeus was about a bit more than a man who was short in stature and who could climb a tree. That in fact, it was about systems that oppressed people and that Zacchaeus was part of that system. He was a part of the taxation system that collected the taxes from the people. And those who collected the taxes were known to cheat the citizens and they would take extra and add on extra to the taxes and then they would pocket that difference. And our text says that Zacchaeus was not only a tax collector, but he was a chief tax collector, which from my understanding was he was over other tax collectors. And so surely not only did he benefit from this cultural norm, this sad system that had been set up to oppress people of adding on to the Roman tax and pocketing it, surely those beneath him also gave him a portion of their proceeds as well. And the text says that he had gotten very rich, that he was a chief tax collector and was rich. So this man had gained his wealth by taking advantage of others, by taking advantage of the poor and the non-powerful in his community. And it's clear that he was despised by the community because when people saw Jesus interacting with him, they were stunned and they began to grumble, the text says, and to talk about the kind of sinner that Zacchaeus was and to question why Jesus would have anything to do with one who so ill-treated others in the community. It's a powerful story to me because it points out some of the things that we know are true in our world even today, that there are systems that oppress people, that keep them in an impoverished state and cause them to not have the power that they need to access the various means that they need to live a more fulfilled life, to even have the basics in some cases that they need for life. And Zacchaeus was part of such a system in Jesus's time. But Jesus took time when his mind and heart 
were set upon Jerusalem, he took time to be with Zacchaeus and not only to be with him, but to go into his home and to say that even this one, even this one is a son of Abraham and therefore a child of God, essentially is what Jesus is saying that he's not outside of the realm of God's grace. This one is also a child of God. And so Jesus goes to his home. And there's something about this encounter for Zacchaeus about being seen, this one who was not only short in stature from his size point of view, but also from his standing in the community, that Jesus really saw him. Jesus took time to be with him and to acknowledge him. And there's something about that gracious encounter that changed Zacchaeus, such that he has this incredible change of heart and says that he will give 50% of all that he has to the poor. I'll give half of my possessions, Lord, to the poor. And then anyone that I've defrauded, anyone that I cheated, which we're guessing as a chief tax collector was a number of people, Not only will I repay them, I will repay back four times as much. It's powerful to me because I think this story reminds us that forgiveness is not just about a change of heart and feeling remorse for our actions and even words like, I'm sorry. That forgiveness, when the opportunity is there, is also about a change in our behaviors and in our actions and making reparations, trying to repair in whatever way we can the wrongs that we've done. And Zacchaeus's case, because he had stolen from people, the repair was pretty clear. I'll give back financially to the poor and to those that I have taken from. It's not always so clear in our forgiveness journey how to repair a wrong, what kind of behaviors or actions might be appropriate. And it's probably most helpful if we can go directly to the person or the group that we have injured and ask them what reparations would add meaning for them, would be valuable to them, and to see what we can do to honor whatever they tell us. I'm indebted to the work of Dr. Harriet Lerner around forgiveness and around that idea and statement of, I'm sorry. In her book, Why Won't You Apologize? She powerfully talks about what makes for a good apology and what doesn't. And certain instances when maybe we can't give an apology, it's a very powerful work. And in an article in Psychology Today, Dr. Lerner shared this incredible story from the Hasidic tradition that a colleague shared with her, a story about a king and his son. And the story goes like this, that according to this Hasidic parable, there was a king who had quarreled with his son and in a fit of rage had exiled the son from the kingdom. And after a number of years, the king's heart softened And so he sent some of his ministers to find his son and to ask him to please come home. But the young man resisted that invitation. He felt so bitter about what had happened and was still too hurt to return. And so the ministers came back and relayed the message to the king that the son was not returning home. And so he sends them out again. And this time he has a new message for the son. And the message is this, return as far as you can and I will come the rest of the way to meet you. Return as far as you can and I will come the rest of the way to meet you. What an incredible story, parable, that Dr. Lerner shared in that article. And it's a reminder that in this forgiveness journey that it does require, when we are able, to change our actions or behaviors. It requires that we walk some miles, so to speak, to meet the other one. 
and when possible to make reparations to repair the relationship, to take actions that are healing. And sometimes we do that in an individual way, like the king did with his son. We walk that journey to repair and to rebuild the relationship, and we do that one-on-one. -on -one. Or like Zacchaeus did, we do it maybe one-on-one, -on -one, but with a larger community, for he had defrauded many. And some scholars think that this would have changed drastically Zacchaeus's financial situation and the situation of his family. Some even think it might have put them in a state of bankruptcy to have taken these kind of actions for reparation. This story is so much more powerful than I thought as a child, than about a short man who climbed a tree. It's about a man who actually was quite tall when we think about it. He was tall enough. He had a large enough heart and a changed enough heart to make reparations to those that he had wronged. I am reminded in the times in which we are living that this forgiveness journey, sometimes it is one-on-one -on -one, and other times it is, is within a community, like what happened for Zacchaeus and Jericho and the region around it. One of the things that I am touched about recently comes from one of our oldest Presbyterian seminaries, Princeton Theological Seminary founded in the early 1800s. And Princeton at the end of 2019, actually on October 18th of 2019, made this incredible announcement that they not only were being truthful about the history of the seminary related to slavery and their involvement with slavery and acknowledging that wrongdoing, but that they wanted to take the bold step to do some actions of reparation. Of course, sometimes we don't start down the road of trying to repair something because we say, well, we can't get it 100%. No, probably not. But that shouldn't stop us from trying to get some percentages down the road. And so Princeton said that they would set aside $27.6 million for reparative work because of that piece of the history. And it would involve things like scholarships, curricular reforms, changing curriculum, and community outreach, intended to make an atonement for that Presbyterian institution's history of entanglement with slavery in October of 2019. How powerful is that, that one of our institutions acknowledged their wrongdoing, but then went that next step to start the journey of walking down that road. In speaking about that, Reverend and Ann Stewart, the seminary's vice president for external relations said this, in our theological tradition, repentance is about turning to a new way of life. And then she went on to say, it's about meaningful action. And I think that's what this plan represents. Friends, I don't know in the days to come in my own individual life or in your own individual lives if we, like the king, will need to start walking down the road to meet another and let them come as far as they can, or if we will be a part of a bigger story like Zacchaeus and his community or one of our own seminaries, Princeton Theological, where we as a community acknowledge wrongdoing in some way and say, we would like to take actions that represent our repentance. But I pray this day that we are inspired by the story of a man who my, in my mind is no longer short in stature, but quite tall, who took tremendous steps to repair wrongdoing. May God bless us in the days ahead that we might be people of such actions based out of our faith. May it be so. Alleluia. Amen.
it is always our joy in Christian community to remember important dates in the lives of those within our context. And so invite you to check your Connections newsletter to see who's having a birthday in the month of July and reach out to them with a card or a call or by, by some means to let them know that you're thinking about them on their birthday. Friends, please know that those of you who continue to support Green Mountain Presbyterian Church financially are deeply appreciated. We greatly value your faithfulness and your ongoing giving during these times when we continue to worship through recorded worship service and a prayer Zoom fellowship service when we continue together in small groups on Zoom and by other means. Thank you so much for continuing to step up and do what you can financially to keep this church strong during these days. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, when we gather for communion at this time of year, so near July 4th, it confronts us with an irony. We call July 4th our Independence Day. But what we celebrate at the Lord's table is not independence. It is dependence upon our Father in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is also interdependence on one another as brothers and sisters, part of the body of Christ. And so it is in a way for our nation. When we begin naming this holiday back before the break of the 1800s, it was independence that we celebrated. We were across oceans from dominating powers. But as time went on, we realized it wasn't just independence. In 1812, the British came back and burned our capital before we fought them off. During the Civil War, we found that alliances with the great powers were very important for both sides. And then as we became more of a world power, well, even then in the Spanish-American War, we wanted the approval of other powers. In World War I, becoming a great power ourselves, we were called upon to come to the rescue of friends. In World War II, even more of a threat, even more importance 
to being part of an independent, an inter interdependent nation under God, drawing upon God for strength and guidance. So, we celebrate today on this uh, Independence Day weekend realizing that it's not only us as Christians who are dependent on God and interdependent, but it is our nation as well. And so we can sing in one of our favorite patriotic songs as we seek to be a better nation. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. So we come not only as individuals, but as citizens of a great nation to this table of remembrance and renewal. And we remember that the Lord Jesus prepared this feast for us so that we may be reminded where we stand in God's sight, precious. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for this renewal of our bond with you, dependent upon you, seeking to become better as time goes on, better as individuals, better as neighbors, better as a nation. We pray that you may indeed confirm our souls in self-control, our liberty, our grace in law. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on that great night before he faced the cross, took bread first, took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it. Broke it saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Share this in remembrance of me. And this can be your moment to share of the bread. At the conclusion of their feast, further along, he poured the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Drink of it all of you. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show the Lord's death and his risen life among us until he comes again. In thanksgiving, let us pray. By your grace, O Lord, we have come a long way as a nation and as individuals in neighborhoods, towns, and cities. But how far we still have to go. And recent days remind us in the epidemic around us of our dependence on you for health and strength and in the way we treat one another, how far we have to go to be a truly a brotherhood injustice for all. So we pray, strengthen us in this feast. Send us forth with your blessing to do your will in this world. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lived among us, died for us, reigns in risen life, who has given us this prayer as our model that we sing together.
a special appreciation to Pastor Rich for helping with communion today and ongoing appreciation to our musicians and tech team for putting this incredible service together for us every week. We are excited that this week on Wednesday from 10 to noon in our church parking lot, we will have a drive for the Action Center for both food and school supplies. So please come by and just pop your trunk and masked volunteers will get the items out of your car for you. And then we will make sure that they get to the Action Center and are given out into the community to those that need at this time or for children as they prepare for school. Friends, please also know that this week we will be starting on Thursday afternoon at four o'clock the Zoom study of the book I Am Still Here by Austin Channing Brown. You can order that online even now and uh, get busy reading in these next few days and join us. We're only going to be going through about half of the book on Thursday the 9th, so feel free to come and join us for that time. And we do hope if you're watching this before 10 a.m. on Sunday morning that you join us for our prayer Zoom fellowship time and you can find the link for that in your Connections newsletter. Friends, let us go forth from this place with the sound of liberty ringing in our hearts. But may it ring in our hearts in such a way that we want to do all we can to make it true for all God's children. May God bless us on this journey as we continue to learn from such characters in our Unraveled series as Zacchaeus. May we, like he, do what we can to repair the places where there are breaches in our world, and especially any that we may have been a part of, that we might take steps to repair and to heal. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you deep and abiding peace, both this day and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen.